Hey guys, welcome back to KIS module 7.4. This module is all about alcohols as you would already know by now. So we've been uh, dealing with the reactions that alcohols undergo. So we've been through some substitution reactions, um, some dehydration reactions, uh, combustion. So we've been dealing with quite a few reactions. This lesson we're going to be going through fermentation and hydration and hopefully oxidation if we have the time. So Let's get started with fermentation. Fermentation is one you probably should have heard of before. Um, you probably didn't learn much of the science before, um, but you should already kind of know what it is. It's basically turning um, ethanol into what? It's basically turning, um, no, sorry, basically turning glucose into ethanol. So uh, I think I remember doing this in year 10 science. You probably should have as well. But now in year 12, we're going to be going through the mechanisms by which fermentation works. Um, not in too much detail, we just need to know how it works. Um, so this all should be quite familiar for you. So um, what we do is we use yeast. So fermentation by yeast is actually an anaerobic process. Um, what's an anaerobic process? It means free oxygen is not needed. So basically it's a reaction that, that is better off without any oxygen, so in a sealed container. If oxygen is present, um, some of the ethanol we have can actually be oxidized to produce an undesired, um, like, basically it'll make ethanoic acid because it'll oxidize. You haven't learned oxidation yet, so you don't know how that works, but just know that this has to be an anaerobic reaction. So let's start writing that down. So fermentation, fermentation by yeast. Yeast is actually called zymase in like the scientific terms, but yeast is an anaerobic process. Okay, that is free oxygen is not required. Okay, um, just be careful. It's not that it's not just required. It's also bad for the process is also bad for the process let's also put that in there it's also bad for the process awesome so what um what are the other things that we need for fermentation we usually need a temperature at about uh 36 35 degrees um anything above that will actually denature enzymes in the yeast what does that mean? It'll basically um, kill the yeast or kill what is doing the fermentation. So we want we don't want anything to kill the yeast. We actually want to help it grow and help it um, feed more. So we're going to be using a temperature of approximately 35 degrees. Uh, so let's do temperature approximately 35 degrees Celsius. Some people write 36. Um, 35, 36 is good. Nothing above 40 degrees as it will denature the enzymes in the yeast. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I've been getting a little bit sick um, lately. So I'm sorry if I take a little bit of time to kind of speak or like have a cough or whatever, I'm really sorry, um, but I'm just getting a little bit sick. So um, anything about 40 degrees, it will denature the enzymes in the yeast and it's going to stop the fermentation. Fermentation. So, of course, we don't want to go above 40 degrees. Okay. So what happens in fermentation is that the ethanol produced is actually the waste of the yeast. So the yeast feeds on the glucose and then the, wa the waste it produces ethanol. Obviously, nothing can live in its waste, including yeast. So usually um, when the concentration of ethanol gets too high, so when there's too much ethanol, the yeast actually die because that is their waste. They don't like ethanol. They just um, feed on the sugar and then they make the e ethanol as a waste. So, what scientists have done is that they've actually made genetically modified um, yeast strains that can be alcohol tolerant up to about 15-17%. Before, it used to never be that high, maybe 8-10% tops, but now we use 
genetically modified yeast strains that are alcohol tolerant to levels of about 15 to 17%, which is actually quite good compared to what we used to use before. So make sure we use this type of yeast. Um, if we use regular yeast, it's still going to work, but it obviously it's not going to be as efficient because when the level of um, ethanol gets to about uh, 8 to 10%, they're going to kill, it's going to kill the yeast. Okay. So after we do the fermentation and we have about 17% ethanol, how do we separate the ethanol from the rest of the solution? We actually use fractional distillation. Uh, there we go. Fractional distillation. Distillation to separate ethanol from rest of mixture. Awesome. So we use fractional distillation. Um, when we use fractional distillation, we actually get about 95% ethanol. Okay, so they, it's actually not called ethanol, it's called hydrous ethanol. Um, which is called hydrous, whoops. Hydrous ethanol. Okay, so um, we don't actually get 100% ethanol. We can get 100% ethanol, which is called anhydrous ethanol. Um, it can be a, a pretty much only um, obtained by using a porous solid. So um, let's do this to 100% ethanol. We use a porous solid. Um, some good porous solids. Um, this one is the pretty common one. It's called aluminium silicate. Aluminium silicate. Okay. And they basically all have a name called zeolites. Zeolites. That's a Z. Zeolites. Um, just in case if you, if you want to look up any others. 100% um, ethanol is called anhydrous ethanol. And that's the ethanol we always want. We don't really want hydrous ethanol. Um, if you can kind of remember from 7.1 or 7.2, ethanol is a very small alcohol. It's a very short carbon chain alcohol, only two. And what does that mean for us? That means it's since it has the hydroxyl group, which is very polar, it's going to be very, very sol soluble in water. So it's going to be actually very hard to separate water and ethanol since they're very soluble in each other. We usually say that ethanol is infinitely miscible in water, which means you can basically pour as much as you want and they're going to dissolve in each other very well. So um, now that we've obtained 100% ethanol, let's actually write the equation for fermentation. You probably would have seen it before or you would be a little bit familiar with it. The first, oh, sorry. We start with our sugar, which is a glucose, C6. H12O6, and that is aqueous, okay? And then we have our reaction, the yeast, or actually I like to write zymase, because it just shows you know more about this. Zymase, 35 degrees, okay? So we have th zymase, 35 degrees. We make two ethanol, and two carbon dioxide. And that's it. That's our equation um, of, that's a bit small, so let's write it under it. Plus 2 CO2 gas. And that's our fermentation equation. We have our glucose. Glucose. And we have our carbon dioxide. Dioxide. And we have our ethanol. Awesome. So... Just to introduce you a little bit to what we're going to do um, after this, it's in a while actually. Um, if we, we usually get glucose from plants, right? We usually can, we can get it from sugarcane, we can sometimes get it from beetroot. So we can, um, it's basically a, a renewable source. 
So if we make ethanol from glucose, that's actually called bioethanol, which is a cleaner way of using ethanol. And that's why, as I spoke before, sometimes we use petrol called E10, which has 10% ethanol. Um, if we at least try and reduce the octane usage, octane is a hydrocarbon, so it's from the earth. Um, if we try to reduce the octane usage and use at least 10% ethanol, which is bioethanol, we'll actually be, do be doing the environment a great favor. But we're going to be uh, going through this whole biofuel, bioethanol against fossil fuels kind of thing a little bit later on. Not right now. So um, we've just finished fermentation. Let's move on to hydration. We basically uh, mentioned in the last video, I think or the video before, that the dehydration of an alcohol to produce an alkene is actually reversible. Okay, so if we just basically apply what we did before, we can al we can hydrate an alkene. So we said that um, we dehydrate an alcohol to produ produce an alkene. So if we hydrate an alkene, we're going to produce an alcohol. Um, basically, it's just a hydration reaction, and we use a catalyst, which we're going to go through now. So let's start off. Um, this is the reverse process of dehydrating. Let's um, uh, sorry, I always do that. I kind of of dehydrating and alcohol. So before we said um, alcohol, when dehydrated, will produce, um, let's put a dot there, an alkene and water. So the reverse is very simple. We have an alkene, we add water, and it will give us an alcohol. So um, that's very simple. Um, we said here that the catalyst was concentrated H2SO4 or phosphoric acid. You can do that as well. Um, we said that it's a very good dehydrating agent. So we use it concentrated in dehydration. Um, but in hydration, we actually use dilute H2SO4 um, or phosphoric acid. So let's go through an example. Let's just say we have an alkene, which is ethene. Ethene is very simple. So it's very nice to use. Uh, let's use brown. Okay, so we have ethene. And we add water to it. Okay, what we're going to get. As we said before, one of these bonds is going to break. Okay, and one of these is going to break. And then that hydroxyl will go there. And this hydrogen will go here and then we've hydrated um, ethene so we'll get carbon carbon oh h h h h h h h and we're done so it's very very basic um, it's nothing that we really have to spend too much time on um, we kind of spent time on it when we were talking about dehydration so with hydration we'll just leave it there there is nothing very complicated about it and it's basically a few steps if you just keep in the back of your mind the catalyst please don't forget this catalyst or that catalyst if you keep them in mind you'll be fine actually just to ensure you don't forget it i'll write it here as well dilute h2so4 please don't forget that um or H3PO4. Phosphoric acid works just as well. So we either use sulfuric or phosphoric acid. Now let's move on to oxidation. This bit is a little bit, um, it's not difficult, but there's quite a lot to cover. So let's get started quickly and get straight to the point. So as we said before, with oxidation, primary and secondary readily oxidize. Um, tertiary alcohols can't be oxidized under any normal lab laboratory conditions. So let's write that here. Primary and secondary alcohols readily undergo oxidation.
tertiary alcohols oops do not readily undergo oxidation under standard lab conditions I was actually very interested on when tertiary alcohols can be oxidized and they can be oxidized um, but it does involve breaking a carbon-carbon bond which is very high energy and it's very very difficult uh, for the scope of the HSC syllabus we are not interested in that we're just interested in the oxidation of primary and secondary alcohols and we're also interested that tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized okay now let's start with some common oxidizing agents common oxidizing agents okay you need to kind of remember these names because they're going to pop up very very often so uh, let's use black first one is very simple it's acidified chromate uh, always make sure that you write acidified actually acidified CrO3 okay chromate is actually a weak oxidizing agent and then we have two others which are which are very very popular by the way instead of writing acidified we can just do H plus the next one is actually permanganate which is M oops um, MnO4 minus um, you can't find MnO4 minus so we usually use potassium permanganate okay so it's not an, uh, an ion and this is actually a strong oxidizing agent please note that it's acidified you can't just use potassium permanganate you have to use acidified potassium um, permanganate the third one which is also a strong oxidizing agent is called potassium dichromate so it has to be acidified potassium dichromate okay and that's also a strong oxidizing agent so um just to go through them again cro3 or chromate is actually um, a mild oxidant and the other two are strong um, strong oxidizing agents the color of their solutions is actually very important the acidified solution of potassium permanganate so this one is actually violet in, in color so it's actually violet after oxidation it becomes colorless so violet to colors please note these down because they asked a lot more than you would think okay now potassium dichromate is actually orange uh, let's make it look nice and orange and it becomes after oxidation it becomes green um, why is this important Sometimes in questions, they will give you, um, for example, a, like a primary alcohol and a tertiary alcohol, and they'll tell you to distinguish them. Um, so what you would do is obviously put some oxidizing agent. We usually always use the strong ones. Like chromate is one you can use, but we don't use it al like almost at all. I don't think I ever used it in U12. Um, so it'll tell you how do you differentiate a primary and a tertiary alcohol. You basically say you add oxidizing agent to one of them and you wait for a color change if you add dichromate it's awesome like you can just say color change but then you'll be like the band five territory if you want to get that band six or top band six you'd better say that initially you'd have an orange color and if it does oxidize it's going to be a green color which means it's a primary alcohol if it stays orange then it's a tertiary alcohol since no oxidation has occurred okay so please um, note these down they're very good to know and they're not very hard to, to remember after you've used them a couple of times. There's also one other thing you need to know, which are the oxidation reactions um, of these oxidizing agents. These are actually in your formula sheet, so you don't have to memorize them. I'm going to put them here, though, for quick reference. And these actually explain the color changes. This is colorless. Okay, but this is actually violet. So we have a violet to colorless after oxidation. And let's write the oxidation equation for dichromate as well, which is Cr2O7 to minus plus 14 H plus plus 6 electrons 
will give us 2 chromate plus 7H2O. Again, the color comes from here. The, um, the Cr3 plus ion or the chromium 3 ions, they're actually green. And the dichromate ions are orange. So that's where our colors come from. Um, if you wanted to know for your reference. Now that we went through oxidizing, uh, we don't have a lot of space. Um, now, but now that we went through the oxidizing agents, let's go through um, the oxidation of primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. Okay, the first one is a primary alkanol. So let's do primary. So a primary alcohol. Um, if we use a mild oxidant, it's going to be oxidized to an aldehyde. So mild oxidant is going to be an aldehyde. We're going to go through these visually because I think that's a better way of understanding them. If we use a stronger oxidizing agent like potassium um, permanganate or um, potassium dichromate, something like that, like the other two, like the two that we just went through now, it's actually going to become an alkanoic acid. Strong oxidants or a carboxylic acid, same thing. Carboxylic, let's write carboxylic, carboxylic, because that's how you learnt it. Carboxylic acid. Now, for secondary, there's only one reaction that can occur. Whether we use a mild or a strong, okay, we're going to get the same thing which is a ketone so we're going to get a ketone so we are gonna have um let's let's see, try use the other formula that we used not or strong we'll get a ketone in other words it's called an alkanone but same thing you learn to ketone so we'll keep it that way and again tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized so tertiary none uh let's use black none Okay, now let's have a look. Oxidation, uh, let's, let's start with the primary and then we'll go through secondary and then we'll go through tertiary. So let's start with a primary alcohol uh, like uh, propanol. So we have this, 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 this and that. So here this is propanol. I'm sorry about the birds if you can hear them, they're a bit loud in the morning. Um, this is propanol. If we add O, we say from oxidizing agent, you don't have to write, um, you don't really have to write the oxidizing agent, you, you can just do that, that they find with that. Oxidation is actually the removal of two hydrogens and the introduction of one oxygen, okay? So, what happens when we use a mild oxidizing agent? We're going, since this is the primary alcohol, we're going to go to an aldehyde. So what's going to happen here? We're going to lose two hydrogens and our oxygen is going to stay because we already have one. So it's going to look something like this. One, two, three. I'm not going to draw the other hydrogens. I'm just going to put you the unbonded ones there. We're going to get this and that. Okay. This one is going to go and this one is going to go and we're going to get a new bond, which is a double bond O. Okay, that's what oxidation is. It's basically introducing more towards oxygen. Okay, so this is a what? This is an aldehyde as we went through before. Okay, what is the next step? What if we use a strong oxidizing agent? By the way, a strong oxidizing agent also forms an aldehyde, but it just skips that step. Like, um, so we, we usually have for, for primary, we have the alcohol and then it's oxidized to become an aldehyde. And the further oxidized it becomes an acid okay strong we say goes to here uh straight away because it always does but it still follows this reaction pathway so it's going to first become an aldehyde and it's going to further oxidize it to an acid so we're going to go through that here um so if we oxidize this again okay um what's going to happen we're going to introduce another oxygen so it's going to look like this which we know is called a carboxylic acid. So this is the steps of oxidation for a primary alcohol. It's really easy. Uh, it's just alcohol to aldehyde to carboxylic acid. 
now let's go through let's see if we can move this up a little bit um oops that didn't work okay let's go like this like this like this okay let's try and move that up a little bit more okay um okay let's try and draw the secondary one very very quickly and very in small writing so we can fit it in um like this so this is a secondary alcohol there we go and if we oxidize it okay it's basically going to get rid of this hydrogen and just make a double bond o and that will give us a what a ketone so it's going to look like this what i chose brown okay it's going to look like this no sorry we're going to get rid of two hydrogens we're going to get rid of this one and that one because oxidation is getting rid getting rid of two hydrogens and we're going to end up with this ketone so as you can see with the secondary whether we use a mild or a strong it's going to give us a ketone and we can't oxidize anymore there's nowhere else to oxidize we can't oxidize here because there's no oh group we can't oxidize on the left there's no oh group so basically even if you keep adding strong oxidizing agent nothing is going to happen with tertiary we know nothing is going to happen anyway um so we're not going to draw anything for tertiary um, the important distinction that I want to tell you, though, is if we use a mild oxidizing agent for primary, it's going to stop here. Mild, stop, strong, keep going. Okay, so a mild will stop at the aldehyde, a strong will go all the way to the acid. So let's try and make this a little bit neater, because we kind of made it really messy. Um, aldehyde acid this is a ketone okay so keep those in mind um this is the end of the video so we went through oxidation we went through hydration and we went through fermentation next lesson we're going to be going through um the comparison between organic sources uh biofuels and fossil fuels so we'll go through that next lesson and this is the end of the video um, next video will be the last video of 7.4 and the video after that will be going to 7.5 so thank you for watching and i'll see you soon